how does it feel to be among the first humans to set foot on Mars? What are your daily challenges? How do you cope being so far from Earth? I strongly believe that the first person to set foot on Mars have already been born. Maybe it's your nephew, maybe your little cousin, maybe even my one-year-old child, even though I'm not really sure how would I feel about that as a mother. <laughs> Mars has been fascinating us all. So far, so harsh, so remote. But on the other hand, so familiar. We think we have been there. We have received thousands of images from all the rovers that have been there for a while, spirit, opportunity, curiosity. But what about human exploration? What about waking up on Mars, putting on your spacesuit, close your helmet, open the hatch of your outpost, and go working there? Well, there is still a little bit of a challenge in that. We are not capable at the moment to send humans to Mars. But you probably have all seen uh, Mr. Elon Musk sending a Tesla on a Martian orbit. So I'm very confident these smart people will find a solution pretty soon. So I don't want to focus on this problem. I want to assume that somebody, not us, one group of these millennials, have been able to get there, set up an outpost, and they're ready to work. What would they do? Well, according to Mr. Alan Shepard, one of the Apollo astronauts, they will look up in the sky, see this teeny, teeny, tiny blue dot far, far away, and share a couple of tears. Well, we're human after all. But well, they've been trained, they've gone through every possible selection, they are our representative, they are the best of mankind there. So, they will probably just, in a couple of seconds, wipe up those tears and set themselves to work. And this is what the Austrian Space Forum has been doing for approximately a decade. We are performing Mars analog mission, meaning we are searching for places on Earth that look as close as possible to Mars. And there, we perform missions in isolation. We send people out with a spacesuit to perform extravehicular activity. And this is our spacesuit, beautiful Auda. She takes her name from a princess from the Jules Verne novel. But for being a princess, she's quite a tough one. <laughs> Don't be fool. She weighs 45 kilos, takes two and a half hours to put her on. She has one of the most advanced systems for communication, life support systems for temperature control, a lot of sensors, and she's able to simulate on your body the effects of, of a pressurized suit, which is what we will need on Mars. And all those constraints you don't think about, the fact that you're wearing a helmet, so your vision is kind of blocked, the gloves, you have to wear multiple layers of gloves. So how do you do science? How do you operate all these teeny tiny experiments with these huge hands that can do barely a thing? And this is all what we are considering while performing those missions. So as said, she's a princess, a tough one. She's been tested through the most extreme environment. These are ice caves in the Dachstein Glacier in Austria. Why caves? because we know there are caves on Mars. And those caves, are, besides being very interesting from the geological point of view, they might be a winning point. They're shielded from radiation. So as humans going on Mars, uh, we're probably gonna aim for a cave to start our exploration. And of course, uh, Mars is the red desert. So we have to test her through sandstorms. This is a, one of the examples. And what do we do during these missions? We do science. This rover was built in Hungary. Thanks to its particular wheels, it's able to move autonomously through harsh terrains. And with the instruments on, on top of it, it's able to select samples, geological samples from the ground, 
so the astronauts don't have to search for the best samples for the scientists. The rover is pointing to them. They just use these beautiful sticks, pick them up, put them in the pockets that they have, and send them back to the outpost. Other examples, human-machine interface. This is one of our analog astronauts driving one of the most expensive cars you can find off the market, not even on the market, the Eurobot, which was made from ESA. And what else? We test scenarios, operational scenarios. So you have worked the whole day on Mars with your 45 kilo spacesuit, the exoskeleton that is simulating the pressure, exhausted, maybe you are on desert, maybe it's warm, maybe it's cold, maybe you're really, really tired. You can't take it anymore. You cannot move. You're, you're really, you cannot take it. You have to stop. Well, you're on Mars. The closest hospital is six months away. <laughs> what can make your life better? This inflatable habitat is able to host the astronaut and his partner during the activity into a more comfortable environment so that they can remove the part of the suit that is hurting the most, put it to rest, and wait for the outpost to come for help. The hospital is still six months away. There is nothing we can do about that. But at least you are waiting in a more comfortable situation. But, uh, okay, not every day has to be wrong on Mars. There are also days where everything goes fine. You work, you're eight hours in your suit, but okay, you are fit, you're good. Uh, you finished all your experiments, collecting all the sample. You just go back to the outpost with like, yeah, I'm a winner today. I did my job properly. And then uh, finally, you go there, have a good, uh, well, a decent meal, a rehydrated meal sit down, uh, relax, uh, and now you want to talk to your family. So sit at your computer, connect. Uh, hey, how's it going? Uh, today I had a wonderful day on Mars. Uh, how is Earth? How are the kids? Uh, how is everything going? Between these questions and the answers, yeah, here everything is fine, kids are good, the dog is good, uh, everybody had a great uh, day on Earth too, we can't wait to have you back. Well, if it's your wife, it might go on for a while. Um, well, this is quite a painful conversation. It takes approximately 10 minutes for your voice to reach her and 10 more minutes for the answer to come back. So, well, deal with it. It's really a long, long time. So, what are we doing now? As you are comfortably or uncomfortably sitting in this room, at least you're warm, you had a wonderful meal, not coming from rehydrated food. There are, as we speak, 16 people in the desert of Oman who are conducting one of our analog missions. They're gonna stay there for the entire month of February and they just began the isolation phase, meaning this uh, all 10 minutes delay and uh, all this uh, complex configuration. So at the beginning of this talk, I ask you two questions. Now I want you to hear the answer straight from them, since the 10 minutes of time delay have just expired. <laughs> Being out here in the magnificent desolation of the far desert is a truly unique challenge. We are basically, maybe not the people who are going to Mars, but we are the ones who are preparing this grandest journey of our, of our civilization yet to be undertaken. So when we wake up here every day in the base station, it's almost like opening a book with blank pages and writing the first sentences of how to get to Mars. So it's a unique and challenging environment. We are not on Mars here, but we are not on Earth here either. We are somewhere in between. So whatever the journey to Mars will look like, will be part of this and we're taking the first baby steps up here. And that's exactly what it feels like, taking the first baby steps towards the back, the red planet. We are here struggling with many challenges which are very terrestrial, but we'll also will be facing them on Mars as well. Let me show you our natural enemy out here. 
and that's the dust. And there's a lot of out, out there here. So basically, it's a challenge to the equipment, but it's also the scientific challenge of how to use the instrumentation, how to deploy it, at which sequence, and so on, to have an effective exploration cascade on how to search for life on Mars. So it's a challenging thing. Uh, you feel the harshness of any expedition here, but it's a grand journey because no matter what the journey to Mars looks like, we are part of it. And no matter what technology we're gonna use, what kind of science we're gonna do, we always remember the place like this where those journeys started. And that's something that makes me proud. Okay, so now I spoiled you that there is a mission ongoing. I want to talk a bit about what we are doing in this mission. Not so much. I want you still to be willing to read in the newspaper. So some problems that we are having at the moment is carrying mass on Mars. Every gram cost is propellant, is tons of money. So how about trying to save money by growing things on Mars? And this is exactly what we are trying to simulate this time with this greenhouse which will, on one hand, save the, the mass of the food for the astronauts, and on the other hand, will give them the opportunity to get a break from these rehydrated, disgusting meals and have some decent uh, homemade uh, salad. Another challenge is, what if I'm doing a scientific experiment? Very small, something really small breaks, like a screw and I cannot operate it anymore. The famous six months I have to wait for getting a screw back will hold my science for quite a long time. So this time we sent to Mars a 3D printer so that by simply loading what we want to have on the printer from Earth, it can be made on Mars. And this is actually a lifesaver. You don't have to wait six months, you can go on with the science, you have sci happy scientists, happy astronauts, everybody can work, and it's a win-win. Okay, enough about Mars. For every Mars, there is an Earth. <laughs> so, and actually, this is our Earth. Hundreds of volunteers from 25 nations that are devoting their spare time to support our missions. And uh, I'm very proud of them. This evening, I'm gonna go back to this room, the flight control room, and resume my duties as a flight director. What do we do? We plan activities. We plan what the astronauts do. We collect the scientific data. We receive them, we distribute them to the scientists. We are in communication with the astronauts. So the famous 10 minutes, I call you, you call me, and takes forever. We overcome this, we use a chat system so that we can record the questions and provide the answers in due time. We're working in a different, it's not like the space station where I see the astronauts going right uh, and touching the blue cable, I want him to touch the red cable, I just make a call and say, no, not the blue, the red. This is more complex. We have to live in the future. We have to try to imagine what will be the next issue, what will be the next question, what will be the next problem. And this is what makes the Earth part interesting. This is what makes make us thinking we are seeing the future, we are preparing. So do you think we are crazy? Or to say it in a more politically correct way, do you think we are dreamers? visionaries. Well, look at those pictures. They've been taken only two weeks apart from each other on completely different planets. The left is one of these famous rovers on Mars. The right one is in a desert of Morocco. Every mission, we gain experience. We gain knowledge. We add more experiments. We add more complexity. We are getting every time one step closer to Mars. And as Thomas Stern Elliot said, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place 
for the first time, Mars, the new normal. <laughs>